ये जिंदगी ये जिंदगी आज जो तुम्हारे बदन की छोटी बड़ी नसों में मचल रही है तुम्हारे पैरों से चल रही है तुम्हारी आवाज में गले से निकल रही है तुम्हारे शब्दों में ढल रही है ये जिंदगी ये जिंदगी जाने कितनी सदियों से यूं ही शक्लें बदल रही है बदलते चेहरों बदलते जिस्मों में चलता फिरता ये एक शरारा जो इस घड़ी नाम है तुम्हारा नाम है तुम्हारा इसी से सारी चहल पहल है इसी से रोशन है हर नजारा सितारे तोड़ो या घर बसाओ अलम उठाओ या सर झुकाओ तुम्हारी आंखों की रोशनी तक है खेल सारा ये खेल होगा नहीं दोबारा मगर ये आंखें जो खाबगर हैं ये जब तलक हैं ये जिस कदर हैं उन्हीं से सांसों में रोशनी है इन्हीं से बामानी जिंदगी है वाह निदा फाजली how beautifully and with what exquisite words he describes the mystery of life as long as there are visions as long as there are images in their very special ways then our very breath is full of light and our life is full of meaning chetan anand spent his entire life in a world of moving images images that reflected not only the world without him but perhaps even more so the world within him is this an ashram deep in the forest near rishikesh in the himalayas or is this a shack on juhu beach right in the middle of teeming bombay In fact it is both for this is the shack the retreat the source of inspiration for Chetan Anand in the last 40 years of his life This was where in many ways he tried to return to his childhood to the Gurukul where he spent five very important years when he was a very young boy Because from that Gurukul partitions made their way into chetan sahib's life into his art silences words loneliness companionship love desire east west sanskrit english the forest the city it was right here in his beloved shack where for 40 years chetan anand wrote dreamt and then created some of the finest hindi films of the last 50 years and right here sitting in his beloved shack he loved to look out towards the west he lived in the east but in many ways he dreamt about he was inspired by the west and right here at this very gate chetan sahib in total silence would look out across the arabian sea to the west the poetics of cinema what exactly do we mean by that <laughs> here at chetan sahib shack with the breeze blowing and the arabian sea flowing it is almost sacrilegious to talk about theory but in fact i can hear chetan sahib chuckling in the distance <laughs> but sometimes it is not only necessary but very very beautiful every art form be it architecture dance cinema music old new secular religious needs a certain structure a certain code a certain form a certain set of aesthetic principles and that's what poetics is poetics is that aesthetic structure a theory that lays a foundation for true art every art form uses aesthetics uses that theory to break old modes to create new and deeper insights into life and art i'm here to explore a man a director called chetan anand who i've always known as chetan uncle 
Um, and I keep wondering why we always tend to export people after long after they're gone. But I guess with Chetan Uncle, it would have been impossible to explore him while he was still alive because he was probably one of the most remote persons I've ever met. I've actually never sat with anybody who was so comfortable with silence. You could sit with him for an hour and he would not say a word and you would be too scared to say a word. And at the end of it, he'd just smile and as if you had a long conversation and go. To me, the amazing thing about him is that here was a man who'd done broadcast for the BBC and taught in an elite school like Doon School, then coming over to Bombay and joining the Indian People's Theatre Association, which was a very leftist body and full of the most leading artists of the day, named them and they were there, and then making films with a social purpose in view. Chetan, somehow or another, has had a very fertile imagination. For instance, he used to tell us, to look, everyone, um, every night, somebody knocks at my win uh, window, window, and I get up, and there's nothing there. And I'm sure he said, it's a ghost, and it happens every night. And we used to laugh at our, we said, you're absolutely daft and superstition about this. But he was convinced that there was a ghost knocking at his window almost every night. He had a connection with the art world in the, in, in the sense that I think he was fascinated by the drama uh, which, it, which uh, some of the uh, artists' lives uh, showed, like Van Gogh, for instance. He was very interested in in Van Gogh and th I think he was, uh, he did contemplate making a film on Van Gogh and um, I remember him discussing this with me in Simla, he was there and this was about the time of partition. We used to play around with him, I and Indu, the youngest and uh, one of the things was once when we were up in Gulmarg, he used to read us stories from a book called The White Monkey. We used to all pile up next to him and listen to his reading had a good voice. I remember he was, uh, he used to wear a very natty kind of a karakuli topi and uh, a yellow tie and um, uh, he used to, <laughs> we'd walk up and down the mall and the young ladies would, um, you know, uh, look at him and uh, talk and of course he's very pleased with all that. <laughs> Even cinema can be prose-like or poetic. And just as great prose can never be as imaginative, as great as great poetry, it's the same way, poetic cinema will never take the leaps, I mean, sorry, prose cinema will never take the leaps that poetic cinema will. And I think that's where Chetan Uncle's silences came in, because his films were absolutely poetic. There was, you felt that there was a poet making the film, because what he didn't say in between the lines was always as important as what he said. Chetan Uncle was five years old. He was sent away from home. Not just sent away, he was sent away to a place called Gurukul Kangri in Hardwar to live almost the life of an ascetic. This is the source, the original Gurukul, founded by Swami Shraddhanand in 1902. And this is where Chetan Anand came at the age of five in 1920, to spend the next five years of his life. And joining us on this pilgrimage is his grandson, Surya Rishi, the son of Vivekanand, Chetan Saab's younger son. 
Surya and I and all of you are taking this pilgrimage back from the 21st century right to the very source of Chetan Sahib's life, the very source of inspiration, this Gurukul Kangri. You know, we were just at the Today is Gurukul this morning and we saw the schedule starting from 4 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Every Brahmachari, every minute of that day is absolutely scheduled. I mean, you saw you got yoga, then you've got uh, Sanskrit classes, and then you've got havans, and then you've got your, your, your exercise classes. Everything is scheduled. Maybe because of that discipline, yeah, even yeah, today, yeah. You st we still feel those vibrations here. I'm sure. And can you imagine your grandfather going through a routine like that at the age of five? Chetan Anand was born on the 3rd of January, 1915, in Gurdaspur in the Punjab. His father was Peshawari Malanand, a renowned criminal lawyer and a freedom fighter, and his mother, Indro Devi. It was her idea to send a five-year-old Chetan Sahib to the Gurukul Kangri in Haridwar. When asked why, she said, for the good of his soul. Silences. Chetan Sahib was famous for his silences. Umaji speaks of them. Shekhar speaks of them. Both of his sons also speak of them. His silences spoke so much. And walking these corridors today, those very corridors that he must have walked 80 years ago, seeing these jungles where he used to roam, seeing the classrooms where he used to sit in silence and listen to the lectures, listen to the prayers, you can feel those silences that build up inside of him and stayed with him and his films for the rest of his life. Chetan Sahib had passed out of Government College in Lahore in 1934 and BA Honours in English. During his time at, at college there, he had also played tennis. He had represented the, the college in tennis. He was a member of the debating society. He was very much a, a leader on the campus. He was involved in dramatics. But then, he was accepted at the, the City University in London. So he went there in the mid-30s and he, he studied his, for his MA there. And he spent two years, during which once again, Tennis came to the fore. He got a blue in tennis there in London. For personal reasons, he had to return to India before he could complete his studies. He was now 23 years old, 24 years old, trying to find a place in life. In late 1939, the Doon School had advertised for an assistant master in Hindi. And very soon after that, Mr. Foote, who was the first headmaster of the Doon School, began to receive some recommendation letters for one Mr. Chetan Anand. Those recommendation letters said two very interesting things about a young Chetan. One is that he had a very keen mind and a very charming manner, and the other was that like many other young men who were full of passions, he was slightly casual in his approach to life. Well. He was selected by Mr. Foote. He came here to this Doon School in early 1940, and he brought with him his passions, his passions for languages, Hindi and Sanskrit, which he taught, for English, in which he also taught, and for theater. The Rose Bowl, the Doon School, 2006. <laughs> 66 years ago in early 1940, when a 25-year-old Chetan Anand joined this very Doon school as an assistant Hindi master, this Rose Bowl was just being built under the guidance of Mr. Martin Chetan Saab Sr. And Chetan Saab immediately joined in the process with great passion, great interest. Mr. Martin, Chetan Saab, the other masters, and the students, literally with their own hands, carved this beautiful rose bowl out of the jungle. Surya. <laughs> Lost in thought. Just like your grandfather must have been more than 60 years ago sitting on these very steps. Can you imagine that? 1940 was a long time ago. It was a hell of a long time ago. And you know, the very first play that was performed in the Rose Bowl early in 1941 was Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. 
Can you imagine your grandfather, your dadaji, being involved in every single aspect of the play with such excitement, such passion, costumes, direction, lights, acting? Huh? Can you imagine him? <laughs> and then before he left, they also performed Macbeth, one of Shakespeare's most passionate, most dramatic plays. How he must have loved that also. And there's that famous dialogue about tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. He also brought a passion for music. He used to play the violin. So by the time he had made a home for himself here in the Dune School, he lived at the Chamari, which is just down here. And then he, he fell in love. He fell in love with the young lady from Lahore, Uma Chatterjee. And while he was here at the Dune School in 1942 and 43, he decided to get married. When your grandmother and your grandfather got married, they shifted here. Then it was known as Chestnuts. It was a place where married couples stayed on the Doon School. During the four years here, his mind or his spirit was roaming into other directions. He used to write scripts, he used to send them to Bombay, he used to dream about doing so many things. And I think by the end of his stay here, that was the end of 43, early 44, he was going re he was growing restless. He, he wanted to do more and he knew that he had to leave the confines of the school. Forty-one Pali Hill. The year is 1944. Chetan has come from the Dune School. He and Uma are recently married. They move into this old ramshackle bungalow at the foot of Pali Hill. Slowly, other people join them. And what is formed is a chamari, as Uma so lovingly calls it. A gathering of chums. There was Balaj Sani. There was Uzra Bhatt. There was Ravi Shankar, there was Mohan Saigal, there was Geeta Roy, so many people. There was uh, Zora Saigal. 41 Pali Hill will never leave my memory. <laughs> it was a very strange place. In the mornings we used to do plays with British theatres, but in the evenings I joined uh, IPTA, Indian People's Theatre Association. And that is my first contact with Chetan. But I to ki picture me kia and that was also my first picture and out of all this artistic atmosphere a story began to emerge it was a story basically conceived by Hayatullah Ansari the writer and it became the story of Nietzsche Nagar it was said to have been inspired by Gorky's The Lower Depths I'm not so sure of that but the best thing about Nietzsche Nagar apart from the performances the art direction the music the lack of big sponsors. It was made on a very modest budget and made with such elegance, taste and sensitivity. But of course the best thing about Nietzsche Naga was it was the first Indian film to win a Grand Prix at Cannes when the festival opened after World War II. He was in excellent company with Sir David Lean and Lindquist who was Ingmar Bergman's cameraman. It was a period of Struggle within India. The British were almost on the way out, but they had not left yet. Footage was very difficult to get because the government had taken it all into their control to make promotional films for their own ends. But they were giving some raw stock to certain artists. And one of these was Chetan Saab's friend, Rafiq Anwar, who was a Kathak dancer. He got some raw stock. Chetan Saab and his wife Una, Uma had a story to tell. And the film started on a very, very low budget. Chetan was planning to shoot Nietzsche Nagar, looking around for the cast and so on and so forth. One day, we talked. He said, can you suggest someone? I said, I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to take a picture. Look 
Rahmani Kaushal Chetan discovered her and made her the heroine of Nishanagar. The young lady's name was Uma Keshap. And somehow or another, I think neither of Chetan nor me, we didn't like this name as a film name. I don't know who decided to give her the name Kamdeen Kaushal. Probably Chetan did himself. It is an allegorical look at possibly the freedom struggle because Chetan Saab's father and also his eldest brother were very much involved in the freedom struggle and Chetan Saab also felt very deeply about it. But above all, it is a film which very powerful, powerfully states that oppression, oppression in any form is absolutely wrong and must be stood up against. Nala hamari basti se nahin guzar sakta. Tum bila ijazat andar kyo chale aay? Nala hamari basti se nahin guzar sakta. Main aap ki sab chalein samajhta hoon. Aap paise se humara iman, humari zameen, humari tandrusi sab khareed na chate hain. Magar yaad rakhiye, aise dil bhi hain jo aap ke pandu mein nahin ban sakte. Khamosh. Ab khamoshi ka zamana guzar chuka. Khamosh mat maas. Chabra se. Isse bahar nikal do. Yaad rakhiye sarkar ki. ये सारा गमान निकाल दो आप जैसे मतकार निकाल दो चार बार निकाल दो पानी जल्दी Thank you. 